What makes a great fashion image? Ah, oh, great fashion image. Um, something that makes you stop when you're reading the magazine, I guess. Mm. You're flicking through and very often nothing stops you and then you come to something that's arresting and pulls you in and maybe confronts you or um, affects you in some sort of way. So it has to have emotion? For me it does. To grab me in it does. But not for everybody. I think other people are more interested in the clothing and the silhouette and the fabrics. That hasn't ever been my first love of fashion imagery. Yeah, you said before in interviews that it's um, perhaps mood rather than trends or rather than clothes that interests you. Tell, yeah. tell me more about that. I think I start with a character or narrative. I start with a, sort of with the casting, with an imaginary character and then I'll cast somebody who I think will fit that and be able to portray that. And then I get the clothes and the clothes will be used to tell you more about the character. So mm. something like the pair of shoes she's wearing is really important or what bag she carry or whether she would carry a bag. I'll sort of go approach it in a way that you might approach doing a film or a short film. It's interesting because I want to go back and ask about sort of your earliest life and I wonder were you always interested in fashion or were you always interested in characters? I was aware of fashion because my parents were very fashionable and sort of glamorous and always dressed up and would dress for dinner every night and be very sociable and so it was always something that I had at home mm. um, and we, me and my sister were always dressed in long Laura Ashley dresses and Afghan coats and quite extreme um, fashion but I, th I think I was drawn sort of attracted to the imagery more than the industry of fashion magazines. So I was sure. um, sort of lost in my own imagination a lot as a mm. child. Um, I went to a boarding school which was probably the most boring place on earth. So <laughs> a lot of time was spent in a sort of imaginary world and not um, being present. What were your ambitions when you were a young person? Did you think about jobs or anything like that or did, were you very much in that kind of boarding school world? My first idea was that I would buy an island in the Hebrides or outer <laughs> Hebrides and I'd be self-sufficient and I'd farm and I'd have grey horses and ride around side saddle with long dresses on and with my friends and then at about 13 um, I think maybe I met a friend of my mother's who was the um, Vogue Living Editor and so from about the age of 13 I, I wanted to work at Vogue. It's like the island, it was kind of an escape in some ways then. Yes, I mean it was... And what was it that and I, 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 I loved everything, I loved the fact that it said Vogue House, I liked walking in there and the letter heading and the style, it was so stylized at that time. Mm. Um, and there were very strong women and strong editors at that time. There was Grace Coddington, Liz Tilberis, um, Sheila Wetton, Beatrix Miller was the editor, who was sort of forceful, witty, quick. They were all, and, and Lucinda Chambers was there. Mm. So they were um, all sort of role models. I wanted to be in that world. I didn't want to go back and be in a sort of normal life. I was very, very happy in that environment. It was sort of a taste level which I hadn't experienced before. You know, it was sort of, you just had white lilies from um, Pulbrook and Gould and you had your dry cleaning done at Lilliman and Cox and there was a whole language there which you went for lunch at Chaconis and it was a very rarefied time and then at the end of it, everyone was dressed in Azadine Alaya. Mm. Um, it was very disciplined. It was a, it was a sort of um, whole new thing for me. And did you like the aesthetics or the designers that Vogue was talking about and championing? 
Yes, because Azadine was a big thing then. Mm. Um, body map had just started and culture shock. There were new designers. Um, and then there was Margaret Howell. So there was lots of different aesthetics at the time. There was Bruce Weber doing all the shoots with girls in herringbone tweed coats with flowers in their hair. And then there was sort of very minimal Azadine mm. um, aesthetic. And then there was the body con, body map type thing. And how did you used to dress? In Azadine. <laughs> Tell me about how your trajectory went, because in the end you were assisting Grace Coddington. Yes. Has it impacted how you style? I don't know if it's affected the style, but I think her perfectionism's probably rubbed off and um, attention to detail and mm. learning lots of little tricks, but I don't think that I, I remember one of my early shoots was white shirts, which was definitely a sort of rip off of Grace's shoots. But then, quite soon after that, I left Vogue when she left Vogue, mm. and I sort of reacted to um, reacted to my experience. Mm. Is there? I felt sort of the immediate thing, having been so safe there, I felt, you know, it's sort of you're out on your own suddenly. So when you're calling up, you're saying it's Venetia Scott, and they say, from which magazine? And you go, ah, oh, I'm <laughs> freelance now. And you get passed around. So there is that initial sort of finding your feet again. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a reaction against anything, really. It wasn't anti anything. It was. Um, I think I'd been in an institution from a very young age and then in a way Vogue was another institution and and I loved it at Vogue and I felt very safe there but when I came out of it I I did want to do something different and I wanted to celebrate a different type of woman a di different girl mm. um, and I remember seeing Larry Clark's book teenage lust and just feeling that's who I want to be I want to be in the waterfall in the sunshine and have blonde hair and a round face and dance and you know it was sort of wanting to get rid of all the um, repression I guess that I'd grown up with for a long time. So just going back to I'm interested that you said the word repression were you not very happy at school? Um, no it wasn't my happy happiest moment. In a very beautiful way, some of the themes that, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, that I imagine came from being at a boarding school mm. and being in that environment, things like um, youth and sensitivity and puberty and loneliness and escaping are themes that I think run through your work. Is that conscious, do you think, that you project yourself and, and those, those experiences onto the girl? Or is that just something that's innate? I think there's a sense often of melancholy or mm. there's a sort of um, sometimes an emotional sadness which may be cut the melancholy maybe comes from that but the other side is trying to break free of it was the idea of breaking free of status things and just that sense of running and being you know, the wind is always a thing for me in pictures. The idea of wind on your hands and often the countryside and wide open spaces and the feeling of light. I think that's the girl. Maybe she is a mix. She's a mix. When you first left Vogue and you'd just gone freelance, who, yeah. who were the calls, that, who were the magazines you were ringing up? Who were the photographers that you started working with? Well, The Face and ID, Lay and Père Louis, the Italian magazines, mm. um, Arena. I worked with Michelle Haddy and then I met Jürgen quite soon after I left Vogue and then that began, we worked together for 14 years so. Tell me about that because that that's an amazing collaboration. Yeah, that was a sort of extraordinary thing to be really living pretty much 24 hours a day with someone over a long time. Um, having that exchange of ideas and that understanding of 
the language, each other's language, and I think we have both brought very different things because I would um, be much. I'd I'd have an idea and I'd pre I'd find the location and I'd um, generally do the casting mm. and get the clothes and then sort of almost give that to him and he would bring something completely fresh to it and um, sort of in give it life and throw it off. So it wasn't too, I think if I'd been doing photographs then it would have been too, um, I wouldn't have had the confidence to mm. have done it. And do you think that you both did have quite different references, even if you had similar sort of sensibilities? Obviously we had different backgrounds. Um, I'm not sure that his childhood was the easiest time either. Maybe that, you know, we both had that. But um, I don't know, when we met it was just an exciting time in fashion and we were excited about making images together. I do think in the end he w he needed to find his own mm. he needed to find his own voice and not have these stories brought to him. Mm. And tell me, it's interesting. You just said they're stories. You said I'd bring these stories to him, and I'm interested in that. Would you, because you've said you know it is about the girl. It's not necessarily about the clothes. But would it be as um, as extensive as you'd almost come up with a story for her, a narrative for yeah. her? Yeah, I think I just have two types of girl. And in, when I was styling, I had two portfolios, and one was the um, the girl really who I wanted to be, who was generally blonde with blue eyes and this round face and this openness and this sort of ease um, and um, lack of inhibitions. And then the other girl, was maybe more like me, and it was a bit more sort of rigorous and often, um, I don't know, she was more the dominating, mm. dominatrixy type girl, the other one was, but then I feel like I have both sides. Mm. And, and I think clothes are exciting for that reason, that you can wear jeans and you can forget about having anything on in a way you know you can sit on the pavement and roll around in the dirt and it doesn't matter but you can also dress for a dinner and you know the power that you're you know you can play a different you it can give you strength as well mm. Mm. wearing a great dress or playing with the sort of power I suppose it seemed from what you said before you, that you never consciously were trying to be you know, anti-fashion or go this way while the rest of the fashion pack was going that way. But I think, you know, looking back, that's kind of what's been written into history. People talk about it like it was, you know, so pivotal and so right. influential. Did you get any sense of that at the time? Not really. I, I definitely got a sense that something was going on and the teams were all working individually. I was working with Jürgen and um, Melanie was working with David Sims and and with Corin, and then collectively there was a sort of movement that happened, even though I think we all maybe came from a different direction. Mm. Um, and I remember they used to have these festival of fashion photography, and we'd all be flown to Biarritz or Monte Carlo, and we were young men, and you, we definitely, there was a feeling of excitement about being this new thing, and we were called um, La Nouvelle Vague Anglaise mm. by, I can't remember, one of the French magazines and and it, it felt like we were turning things over and it felt as if we were doing something quite radically new but it wasn't in reaction to something that existed. Mm. It was just, um, it was just a new thing and it What was great about it was it didn't have a reference to any decade that had been before. It was a new yeah. look. It was a completely, had these long skirts on and big army coats and long hair. I think we looked like these sort of 
Amish people. And then there was, there was a sense of rebellion and breaking down the hierarchy. And um, I remember going to Margella shows where there were no seats and everyone had to sit on the floor and seeing the, other, the editors coming in sort of from American Vogue and there was no chair that was brought out. They had to sit on the floor and that was all, it was exciting. Did you intend your work to be political in any way? Because I think that sense of it not being about the luxury of fashion and not being about sort of the money and the clothes, that, that has a political message and it has been read politically, but was that part of the intention? I don't think so. I don't think it was about... I mean, it was an intention to let go of status symbols and status bags and sort of an ostentatiousness. It was, it was a decision to get down to much more bare, raw things and not have the artifice of makeup, a lot of makeup and accessories and mm. things that covered you up or heels or things that sort of... It was about taking, paring things down. Sometimes I watch shows and the, it looks like the shoes are too high for the girls. I hate that when they can't walk properly. Mm. I sort of think, why are you doing this, this to women? What are you mm. sort of... You know, you're not enhancing life or bad energy. I want to talk about the photography because you know, we talked a lot about you as a stylist, but you are an image maker in so many ways. And, and, and since 2000, and, about 2005, mm. you, as you say, you've, you've focused an awful lot on photography. What made you want to do... Because it's quite, a, I think it's quite a daring thing to do. Fashion people get very set in their boxes in a way. You're a stylist, or you're a designer, or you're this. And yeah, was it hard in any ways to make that tr transition? And, and what sparked it? When I stopped working with Jurgen, I worked with different people, and it was just never the same collaboration in a way. I think because I wasn't able to bring so much to the shoot or they weren't used to somebody bringing so much to the shoot so it was sort of annoying I think it was sort of annoying for <laughs> some photographers to have somebody sort of pushing their view and saying I want it like this I didn't see it like that I saw it like this and you know I'd be literally sort of on their <laughs> shoulder there. there yeah <laughs> really annoying um and it was and it was frustrating for me that what I'd imagined wasn't what was happening necessarily. So mm. it seemed very natural because I'd always done the set the thing up anyway, I'd always find the location and find the model and sort of directed hair and makeup and find the clothes. So just to have the camera in my hands, it didn't seem that big a jump. Mm. I think a lot of image makers it's it's strange to look back through your archive and back through your pictures because you do kind of you know, it's your life in some ways, mm. and you can... It is your life. It yeah, but gobbles that must you be... up. It definitely... Yeah. There's no um, work-life divide in this. It's... <laughs> you've... You know, you, it takes over your life for sure. It matters, and it... Matters hugely. Mm. Probably too much. Is I it hard for you looking at them ever? Do you ever... Does it remind you of ways you felt? Mm, not really, no. Because it's never sort of... So literally... Me. It's... It's, it's bits of me, but, or, or it could be something that I, someone that I would like to be more of, so, you know, they're imaginary characters, and sure, they have bits of you, but it's definitely not me mm. entirely out there. Mm. And actually, the, the blonde girl is, sort of the opposite you know she's like my ideal she's me at my best but she's definitely not me at the most of the time do you think you'll always chase her because she's easy going you know <laughs> she's just like everything's fine and she'll let it go and that's um you know yeah maybe i'll chase her maybe i'll be her one day just <laughs> <laughs>